Hello, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> there is, be aware that there is a third, about a 20, 30 second delay on this stream while my poor old computer uh, transcodes the video. But uh, throughout the session, if you have questions, write them in the Slack channel and um, 30 seconds later, somebody will uh, interrupt me and we can address your question. It's not ideal, but you just have to live with it. Indeed. And good morning from me as well. So, we've so what are we going to do today? Today we're going to look at how the web works. Um, I presume most we have, at the moment I've only got 15 viewers. So maybe just give it a couple of minutes. Yeah, everyone that's in the uh, the CC web channel, go and click on that YouTube link that Matt has put up because we need to get you up there as well. I did say at the top there are 37 of you, so we're expecting to see 37 people watching YouTube at least. Oh, not everyone is supposed to be channel. Hopefully, there's no problems with the stream. For those watching on a replay, I'll try and remember to put a link in the description to where we actually start. Oh, that could be, of course, the web links link. Uh, Lewis, yeah, there's no live comments because uh, we've got nobody sitting here to police them. Live comments will be in the channel. So yes, we are still waiting for more people to join. I've got 23 at the moment. Maybe we should always start with elevator music for the first five minutes. Oh god, now you're going to try and make me put a soundtrack in at the same time. 29 guys, come on. There's 30. This, well, it says about 28, 30, so. Okay, um, Rich, do you want to say anything before we start? Um, I, I suppose the, the, the main thing to say is that the reason for um, this, this particular content is that the web is something that we all use every day and have been using constantly for the last 30 years or so, some of us now. And um, actually just understanding under the covers how it all works is something that, that often goes without really being questioned. So um, this is a, a bit of a dive into the under the covers of, of how it all works and why it all works the way it does. That hopefully just helps it all make sense. So with that, Matt, you have some slides, don't you? I do. Let's go to the slides. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so as Rich says, we're going to have a look, a sort of anatomy of exactly um, how things work when we request resources on the web and where we are now as, as in comparison to a few years ago. So, you know, the web is a typical client server system. Um, you have the browser which acts as a client and then you've got some server which is sitting on an IP address somewhere out there in the web. So everything is connected through something called TCP IP and everything is given a unique address when it's on the internet. Obviously, it's not quite as simple as that, but for, for now, we'll stick with that. I can hear an echo from somebody's machine. I think it's probably Rich's. Um, so, um, Yes, so the browser makes a request to a server and anything which responds to a request on the internet is in effect a web server, um, specifically if it responds to an HTTP request. And then the server will send the requested resource back. But how does this actually all work? So the first thing we do is we make a request to something called a URL. And you've seen them maybe uh, if you've done any web programming before, 
or any scripting or just a little bit of HTML, you'll see that you've got um, hyperlinks, um, which you may have used in your HTML pages. And it, as you can see from the bottom of the screen, there can be lots of parts to a, to a URL. So the first part is the scheme. And um, for HTTP, that's just simply HTTP colon. And then for some reason, uh, which I won't go into, there is a double slash before it. Um, the web is an evolving standard. Not all of the schemes have two slashes after, but HTTP does. Um, users, when they use a web browser, uh, typically uh, it can ignore that bit because if you don't specify what scheme that we're using, the browser, and you type it into the address bar of the browser, it will just assume you're using HTTP or as maybe happened, what, a year ago? Uh, Google started defaulting to trying HTTPS first, which is just a secure version. So at the beginning, uh, you can have a username and a password if you want, um, but you don't really need to do that. And obviously, if you're making a plain HTTP request, bunging the password in the URL is not a very secure way of doing things. So we tend to avoid doing that. Um, then the next part is called the host. And that's, you've see, all seen those before. The one that's reserved for examples in web slides is, you know, when we teach about the web is example.com, but you can have port.ac.uk or bbc.co.uk there. And then after that, you can specify the port on which this web server is running on. Now, if again, if you admit the port, um, the web browser assumes we're going to be connecting on port 80 because that's the standard port for HTTP or HTTPS would be 443, but you don't need to specify it. But you know you can run multiple web servers on different ports on the same machine. For those of you who've never heard of ports before, um, it's just a standard way that computers can run more than one service through a network. Is that clear enough, Rich? Yeah, sounds fine to me. Okay, and then the next part of the URL is the path. So here we've asked for slash forum slash questions. Um, and then you can, and that would maybe on the standard web server would look in a subfolder on the server called forum and then in another subfolder in there called questions. And then you can have a query string, which is a way of passing variables into a page uh, for use later by maybe something like JavaScript or some server-side scripting. And then you can have a fragment, which is um, a way of scroll, making the browser scroll to one particular part of the screen. Are there any complaints about uh, audio? Is everything all right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the echo seems to have cleared itself up. Okay, good. I hope so. So we covered URL. So we make a request to a URL and we expect something back. Um, a little note about absolute and relative URLs. An absolute URL must include the scheme. So if I'm on one site, say, say I'm running my own personal page and I want to link to the BBC's website, I have to put HTTP before that. Uh, otherwise, it will try to look for something on the same server. So um, here I'm linking to localhost on contact.html, and that will always go to that particular host. Um, you can use a relative URL. So say I'm developing on my local machine, and I want to be able to put this on my VM. Um, you can have a relative URL, which will look for those files in the, um, in the same server. So if you move your website from one server to the other, um, you, will be, you won't need to go back and change all of the links. Um, so that's an important distinction to make. Sometimes you see it at beginner websites, they try to link to um, from one thing to the other. So I've had a question, can I explain the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? So all HTTP is, and Rich will show it later, is a serialized string of data. So you send a request to a URL and the server will send you back down over the network a literal string of the page coming. So it will have all the tags letter by letter coming in, a bit like ticker tape or the way that they used to read um, stocks and shares in the old days. It's just you expect this and here it comes back again. The problem is um, that's fine if everybody receives the same resource. For example, us reading the BBC news um, and everybody gets the same content and it doesn't particularly matter if somebody's observing what we're looking at. It's, you know, there's no security issues there, but obviously with things like online banking and with, you know, Facebook and things, we don't want our network to be visible, our network traffic to be visible. So we will use um, HTTPS, which is just an encrypted version of that. Um, we are assured that this encryption is relatively secure, though I wouldn't necessarily 
bet that governments out there in the world can't read it. But for all intents and purposes, it's secure. It's just an encrypted version of HTTP. So we don't remember just standard IP addresses um, all that out there. I mean, well, some of us know that Google's DNS server is 8.8.8.8, but normally we want to be able to have a human friendly way of, rem of going to a resource out there on the internet. And the way that this is done is through the domain name system. So it's a distributed list of um, domain names to IP addresses. So it's a bit like a phone book, except that multiple places on the web keep a cache of which um, addresses are pointing to which computer. Um, when you, if you ever create a subdomain or buy your own domain, you'll find that it typically takes a, few, a couple of hours for those changes to propagate across the whole internet. Um, but it's basically just um, a simple way of mapping names to IP addresses so you know that the port, the port.ac.uk goes to one of our servers sitting on a particular IP address and we don't expect users to remember it. So I think this is an animation. Yeah, so we have, when we look up um, a URL, uh, we look, first of all, we go to our DNS server, which tells us the address to go to. And then the browser go through the magic of the internet, connects to a web server, and on that web server will be sitting the static files to be sent back to the browser. These might be HTML, they might be CSS, they might be JavaScript, and there could be a database there. There could all be all sorts of infrastructure running on that web server. As I said, a web server is simply something which sends us something back through HTTP. So this can be your laptop sitting in a house. It can be, you know, a big supercomputer sitting somewhere, but they all speak the same way and the browser doesn't actually care who it's talking to as long as it's speaking the right language. So HTTP is called a protocol. It's just, and it comes from uh, the human way, agreed way of doing things. It's just, we say this and we get something back. The browser then gets all of that, um, the static, all of the files that came back, all of the, I should say, the string that came back from the server and creates something called the DOM. And the DOM is the browser's internal representation of the HTML that it just passed, of that string that came in. It's read it in. It's, it's now going, okay, I know that this is a title, so I'm gonna start rendering that. And it's a sort of tree uh, structure of what, how all the tags work on the page, which is why it's quite important to use things like valid HTML, because if it's not valid, the browser then has to sort of guess at what structure you actually meant, and they might not do that in a, a particularly uh, consistent way. And then they also um, pass the CSS. So we talked last, well, two weeks ago now, when we were all still on campus, we were talking about CSS, and that's just the way that things should be presented to uh, whatever, whoever is looking at this. And then you've got some JavaScript that can be run as well. So it's not quite as simple as that the browser is just some kind of, it used to be the case that browsers were typically fairly dumb. They just showed, you know, you, you requested a resource and the browser, all it had to do was a display medium for that resource. Now we can send more functionality for the client to use that comes from the server itself. So the server can actually send an extension to the client. You've all used these things without really thinking about it. Something like Facebook chat that sits in the bottom of the screen and constantly updates, that's a specific app that's being sent through job, you know, as written in JavaScript through the web for the client to run, which is why if you go and do further web programming, you have to first send the client for the, for the browser to run, and then you, your app can start running. But for simple pages, um, you maybe don't need any JavaScript or just a little bit. It just gives you interactivity in pages because remember that a web browser simply just displays a file by default. It doesn't have any kind of um, fancy functionality at all because it was designed as a document viewing system. I should have myself a sip of coffee. So when we talk about HTTP, it runs over something called TCP IP, which is the networking stack. You've maybe heard of it before, or you may be covering it in other modules. And we've been talking about, I've been talking about requests and responses. And an HTTP request is a very specific thing. Um, it, it, you send it uh, through HTTP and you get your response back. And you don't actually care about what can be between the browser and the server. They could be on the same network or they could be an ocean between them, but the, the internet is um, working out through all of the routing where that IP address lives and you don't need to worry too much about it. So protocol, as we've said before, is an agreed way of doing things. It's well-defined and it's human readable. And it defines these things, these specific things called request objects and response objects. Um, these are simply just serialized strings with appropriate uh, metadata around them 
sent over TCP socket 80 or 443 for HTTPS and a web server simply sends responses back to requests. So let's have a look at the request. Um, there are these methods here called get, post, head, push, pat, uh, patch, put, delete, connect and options. Um, for this module, all you really care about is get and post. We might do some posting, but you'll be mainly doing with get. And the get request is you've, you've used them all the time. When we request a page by going to something like port.ac.uk, your browser is sending a HTTP get request to the client. Um, the post data are typically sent through browsers when they um, send data through forms, for example. Um, fetch, um, the, this slides from another module, but fetch um, supports these methods and that's a way of, of requesting things dynamically. So um, the two that most commonly used are get and post and in this module we're mainly concerning ourselves with get. So here's a sample HTTP get request. Um, the browser will send uh, get slash HTTP slash 1.1. I'm getting some echo again. Um, the connection is keep alive, uh, no cache. You know, what does pragma mean, Rich? Header that is no longer supported, but everybody still includes it because the web is backwardly compatible by 30 years. So it was an early way of, te of telling um, proxy servers, intermediaries, etc., and even browsers that they shouldn't cache this content. That was then later replaced by the header that comes after it, cache control, which was a slightly better defined cache header. Yeah. Um, we've got something here called the user agent that gets sent through your browser. Now, this is telling the web server what kind of software we're running to make this request. But um, you can't necessarily rely on this because this is one sent through Chrome, but it's also claiming like it, it's like Gecko, which is Firefox. Or, and it's also like Chrome and it's also like Safari. These are ways of um, indicating the sort of content that we can handle. Um, some versions of Internet Explorer claim to be Netscape back in the day. Um, you can, you can, it's reasonably reliable, but it's as it's just a string, it's easily, it's easily spoofed. So if you're writing a big complicated web application and using that as your only way of detecting what kind of client you're running, um, yeah, it's not overly reliable. We've got yeah, the user agent was something that was put in in the early days of the web as something that will be useful and interesting for browsers to be able to tell the servers and. The, the downside of that was that servers started being able to say, oh, you're using uh, Internet Explorer. I'm not going to send you this page or I will add an extra header into this page telling you to go and use this different web client instead. Um, that wasn't particularly great. And in order to get around it, browsers started lying about what browser they were because the servers were looking for a particular string in there, which is why in this example, we see the browser claiming to be both Mozilla and Apple WebKit and Chrome and Safari all at the same time. So it was a way of, of spoofing servers. So what started off as quite a good, honest, straightforward idea ended up being completely stupid. Yay, the internet. We can say the sorts of things that we can accept back from our requests. So you can say, I can accept text, text slash HTML, but I can also accept all of these other things if you can send them to me. So that the HTTP server can go oh, can know exactly what kind of resource we're expe expecting from this request. We've got things like encoding, gzip, and deflate. I presume that's some kind of compression, Rich. Yep. Um, by default, browsers are able to unzip content that gets compressed and sent to it. So if you have a large text file, um, like say for example the home page of uh, Google.com. Well, that page is going to be the same every time it gets sent. So Google can compress it once. And then every time that page gets sent, it is the cache of that page that gets sent, the cache of the zipped version of the page. So Google are sending the minimum amount of bandwidth possible or using the minimum amount of bandwidth to send the maximum amount of data. Your browser then is able to unzip it using very little um, electricity and uh, processing power. And therefore, we all benefit because you're not paying for more data being sent down to your phone as well. Yeah. So the server gets this re request, and now we'll have a little bit look at the response object. Um, upon receiving a request from a web server, the first thing the web, the web server will do um, is decide whether it can actually process that request. Is it well formed? Is it asking me to, is the client asking me to do something which I can and can't do? 
if it, if it can process the request, it will send a response made up of a header with details about the resource that's coming. And then after it's sent the header, it will send the body. So before it sends, so if you ask for index.html on your VM, the first thing the server will come back with is some information about what index.html is, um, when it was last updated, so your browser can decide, um, you know, do I need to download this again, for example, or can I show the one, the same copy that was requested last time? Uh, the body will then come after that. If it can't uh, process that request, it will send a status code saying, why not? So you've all seen error 404, which is a page that isn't found. So if you go to a URL and that URL doesn't exist on a particular server, it will send back 404, sorry, uh, that doesn't exist. So all of those codes beginning with a four uh, indicate a problem the client side. So there's something wrong with this request that came from the web browser or whatever kind of application it is sending me stuff through the web. Um, you know, you've it's been mangled somehow, you aren't allowed to get it, you know, might get a 401 uh, for unauthorized. Um, you might have also seen codes beginning with a five and like 500, you, um, that means that, oh, I've got a problem on my side, so sorry, uh, I can't fulfill your request right now. There are also, um, the codes beginning with a two are usually okay responses, so 200 is an okay response um, and the data will be coming soon. And there's also ones beginning with a three, which indicate all sorts of complicated things surrounding um, I have, I'm redirecting you. Because um, obviously URLs, um, if you have to change them, if other people are linking to you, then all of their links break. So there are ways of the web server redirecting um, one request to another URL if you've changed it. For example, you've renamed a page or you've um, deleted a forum or, a, or something. You've re reorganized your site a bit server side. Uh, web servers can be very simple, so you can. It says you've already seen one using Express. You haven't. I should have. I've had should have uh, changed that slide in this one. But um, you can decide the methods you accept and the URLs you respond to. So, so Express is a very simple uh, uh, server side framework for writing a web server in JavaScript. Um, you'll if you come and do web programming with us next year. Um, if assuming we're all still here, um, we will be doing Express. Um, they can be very complex. Um, you've maybe used Apache before, um, which is the bog stand, the old bog standard way of running a web server, which will run all sorts of things on top of it, like PHP and provide connections to uh, database modules, for example. There's also Glassfish, which runs uh, JSP, uh, Java server side. Um, we're going to skip the rest of this slide. So Matt, should we um, use this opportunity to do a little bit of live demo of uh, HTTP GET and show that working? Yes, of course. Let me, I'll put your screen on now. Yep. Brilliant. So are you able to see everything from me okay? Well, we'll know in 30 seconds. Cool. Right. In that case, I'll just start talking and around this screen. So on the left-hand side, we've got an index HTML, a very simple file with a dot type and a title and some HTML content. So the output from that should be fairly straightforward to guess what it's going to look like. In the bottom right-hand corner, I've got a little terminal, and in this terminal, I can go and have a look at what the content is, and there I can see there's my index.html file, and if I cat that file, we can see that it's the same content that we can see on the left. So what I'm going to do now is start an HTTP server in this folder, and that has now started, and that is serving on 127.0.0.1.8080. Now, Nobody watching this video is going to be able to connect to that because 127001 is the loopback adapter, also known as localhost, and that is a uh, essentially a network adapter that always works. Even if I'm not connected to the internet, I am able to start a web server and connect back to myself, to my own machine, and then check whether or not my web pages are working. So what I can do in my browser, I can stick 127001880. And we see all this content zipping through. Hello. What is Google doing? There we go. See all the content zipping through. And we see the output of looking at the web page. Darth Vader, hello, Jack. I am Anakin Skywalker. It's all there. So that's what the server looks like. But we can talk HTTP directly because HTTP is a plain text protocol. And when we type a URL here, what the browser is really doing is converting that into an HTTP request. 
So an HTTP request is actually very, very simple. And I can demonstrate that using an application called Telnet. So with Telnet, Telnet is a, a, an app for opening a socket between two machines. So making a connection to a server. And we know that this server is listening on 127.0.0.1. And we know it's listening on port 8080. So using Telnet, I ask it to open a connection to that server. And there is my connection. Now, it tells me that the escape character is uh, control square, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to type HTTP. So we know that the first thing is called get, because get Max just showed us this. And I'm just going to ask for the root document. Oh, and I'm going to type an error. And if I type an error, it kills me. And it says, look, it's an HTTP 1.1 400 bad request. So that's an error status message. So I've got to try again. And now I type get slash HTTP slash 1.1, enter. And nothing happens until I press enter the second time because I can now add additional headers here, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to do a plain request with no other headers. And the response to this that the server then immediately begins is it starts off by telling me that I've got a 200 status of okay. Then I've got a whole bunch of additional headers, which I'm not really that worried about right now. Um, the key thing is that after the next two blank lines, my content starts. So there we have my doc type, etc., all the same content that we had initially. So here we have used Telnet to make a connection to a server. And then we have typed a very, very simple HTTP command. And here is the response that comes back. HTTP is plain text. Everything about it can be inspected by any of us, any of you. It makes our lives very easy. Now, you can't always go and do Telnet to a server, but the interesting thing about these browsers that we have is that they have got some very, very useful tools built into them now. And if I bring up my network tab, oh, well, where did that go? That's going to be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, working on that. So here on the right hand side, I've now inspected this page. So if, if in your browser you go and point out inspect on any page, then in the right hand side, I've got a number of tabs. I can look at the elements in the document object model. I can look at a console, which is where output comes. And I can also look at network traffic that's going through. So I'm going to clear the network traffic. And at the moment, it's recording network traffic for me. If I press reload on this page, it goes and shows us that there was a fetch. And if we just close that for a second, if I click on that first one, I can see that my request headers are shown here and my response headers are shown here. Now, these are the same res response headers that we just saw when we were at the command line. And we can also see that it got a status code of 200 back from the server. We can look at what the raw response was. Um, we can even go and have a preview of the page. So we can go and look at every single thing that gets sent between the client and the server. Now that's pretty useful. That means we don't have to be using Telnet in order to understand everything that's going on. But if we want to, we can at the command line, use Telnet, and then start typing HTTP. And we can see the request going through. If I put the server on the left and the client on the right, and as I start typing get, slash HTTP slash 1.9. There is our request going through. And I think that must be it there. Yep. So I close that up. I can terminate my server. And now my, my server is terminated. If I try and make a connection again, the connection gets refused because there's now no more web server. So no. that shows how simple and basic HTTP is under the covers. Indeed. Now, no client will ever use Telnet to look at our web pages, but um, it shows us that if we need to look at the network, what's actually going on there, we have low level tools and HTTP being text based makes it very easy to debug things when we're doing low level. Um, HTTP servers, for example. Okay, so we're back on my screen now. We're done with that, aren't we, Rich? Yes. 
Um, so we know, so the browser receives the response headers in the body as we've seen, the browser constructs the DOM, the CSS model as well. The page then begins to be rendered from the top to the bottom. And if you don't do anything else, if you've sent any JavaScript, that will start to run fairly pretty quick sharp as well. Um, so if you are thinking about doing any JavaScript, um, we're not covering that very much in this module, but um, you may need to wait for the page to be ready. And we'll talk about that some other time. We can send more than text files, obviously. We don't have to send just web pages. We can send images, which we, we talked about images last time, didn't we? Um, we can send videos, sound, we can send binary data and documents. And as of 2020, browsers are supporting more and more natively. So it used to be you had some, you'd use something called Flash uh, to show video live, like we're doing right now. We couldn't do it directly in a browser. Thankfully, uh, we can now do that and everything becomes a lot more easy. So the browsers are getting more and more powerful. So they've come a long way from something which could take nearly all of your CPU time just to display plain text to feature rich applications. And the way we certainly see things going is that they will one day probably kill most native apps because obviously if you have something which runs in a browser, anybody who's capable of running a browser can now run your application. So they don't need to download extra software. You don't need to employ extra programmers to write things in other languages. You can write it once and it can run it everywhere, which of course was the original promise of Java, which it never actually manages. So in summary, we have a browser which sends a request to a web server. The web server finds some kind of resource and sends it back through a response. And the browser then um, processes this and displays it to the user. And that's the end of our lecture for today. Um, I will wait around if any of you's got any questions. But it's going to take 30 seconds for that message. It's going to, to take. Through. So why don't we just let it sit in the uh, Slack channel and um, answer questions through text? Yeah. And then if we need to fire up a, uh, a new discussion, we can. Yeah. OK. Thanks all for watching. And, uh, and stay healthy. Yeah. Remain indoors. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.